Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Mike Lynch, Chief Product Officer of Symphony. And I'm Leslie Spiro, the CEO of Tick42, who are proud owners of Glue42. And we're mainly talking about Glue42. And uh, our good colleague and collaborator, sadly, Demeter, is uh, out sick today. Uh, so he, he helped us a lot, and this is really his, a bit of his brainchild. Uh, so he, we, unfortunately, we'd love to do a live demo for you, but given the little last few last minute changes, uh, we uh, have, we're gonna do a, we're gonna have a video, and we're gonna, we're gonna narrate the video, and you know, hopefully uh, Leslie and I can tiptoe our way uh, and tap dance our way uh, through this. So really excited to be here and, and share with you some of the collaboration that Symphony and Glue42 have been doing around the desktop interoperability standard of DC3. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll walk you through desktop interoperability, the FTC3 standard, walk you through the demo where we're going to showcase Symphony, uh, Glue42, and single track, and then uh, we'll talk to you a little bit more about the future. Yeah, I think as it says, um, we're really trying to talk about real-world use cases. So we assume, I recognize some of you, I assume many of you know quite a bit about what FTC3 does. So there will be a little bit of an introduction um, for people maybe who watch this uh, cold uh, in, uh, on YouTube or wherever it ends up. But um, primarily we want to talk about some real-world use cases and how existing applications and platforms kind of can support interrupt where we go from there. Yeah. So, um, Should we get going? Yeah. So why do we have desktop interrupt? What's it for? Does it solve a problem? And that kind of is the problem. You have many of us work with on desktops running lots of... Can we shut the door, actually, just to keep make it a little, maybe a little bit quieter? <laughs> um, thanks. So we talk about desktop interop not because most of the applications are uh, native existing applications running only on a Windows operating system, but because many of our users run a desktop typically with multiple screens, and use lots of applications, many of which are web-based, some of which are SaaS. And we kind of get used to this idea that each of these applications are individual and separate, and uh, there's third party, there's in-house, there's web, and there's, people call them legacy, I hate that term. Let's call them native applications. Let's call them production applications that have decades of business knowledge and <laughs> UX feedback built into them. <laughs> which maybe we need to change the technology because, let's face it, it's quite hard to get junior.net developers now. Um, but it, they're, good, they're good products. And we work with some Java Swing applications and bring them into this space. We've got one client who is a big VB6 application. Still use it. Support for VB6 withdrawn in 2008. But still, it, it, it kind of runs and it does their stuff. And we kind of taught users almost too well you know, the first question most of your users need to answer when they phone a help desk with a problem is, which application are you using? Because they, everybody understands there's a dev team who delivers an application, and everything within that application is in their domain, and everything outside of that application, who cares? And so I often, we talk to a lot of people about starting on this desktop interoperability journey using Glue42, using FDC3, both APIs and data contexts. And the first thing you say is, what do you do? And they go, oh, well, my user uses my app to work with my data. And you'll go, that's interesting. You know, do they run Bloomberg? Do they run Symfony? Do they run uh, Excel or Outlook? And they go, yeah, maybe. But we're just taught that everything happens. You can only feed back within a single application. And there are these silos every support thing, which dev, which dev team do I need to route it to, and there's no real thought about what else your user is using your application, what other applications your user is running. And the point of desktop interop is to break down those silos and to accept that the unit of analysis, the unit of work, the unit of delivery should not really be the application, but it should be the, um, the workflow. What are you trying to do? I have a job to do, I'm going to move between applications, and this isn't that helpful. Every application running on its own 
very well isolated so that one bad app doesn't crash the system. That's a great idea. But the idea that the only way I communicate between applications is copy and paste or click and highlight a window, that's not a good thing. And that's what Interop is here to do. And FTC3 plays a large part in that. We'll talk about the bits that it doesn't cover. But this basic Interop, what at Glue42 we call click to sync, right, channels, and click to launch, which are intense, and we'll come back to what those mean a bit later. But that's, that's the problem we're facing in all these third-party applications that we're trying to solve. And so this is what a solution within my product, Glue42. There are many other good products out there from, well, quite good products out there, from other <laughs> vendors. <laughs> my friends from Kosaic <laughs> smiled at that. But, <laughs> but with a fairly fixed smile. Like <laughs> really. So, yeah, other, other, other options are available. Um, and the key point is we're trying to bring these things together so the user can consider getting a job done with a load of applications that cooperate, including third-party and in-house applications. And FTC3 is a key part of that. And FTC3 1.2, very successful. FTC3 2.0, even more successful. But the biggest success for FTC3 2.0 is not lots of fancy new APIs. It's not lots of uh, new features and functions. The big, big change is in the intents, which is where applications say, I can do this job to anybody who wants to uh, connect to it, and this is how I'm going to describe a chat, a counterparty, an instrument, what we call FTC3 data contexts. And those are the key. And so to me... The biggest improvement, biggest change in FTC 2.0 was the arrival of companies like Symphony and Single Track, who take part in the um, data context and intense discussion groups. And to me, that's where the biggest change has come, that we have real people, well, they're always real people, real <laughs> applications talking about the data context for real use cases, whereas in 1.2, it's kind of pretty much us... Uh, container vendors, or desktop agent was the term in FTC3, talking about things like an instrument and a counterparty, but not really having real use cases. Whereas when Symphony came in, they were about, how do we des describe a chat? How do you initiate it? When Single Tracker, you know, how do I log a call or contact and that kind of stuff? So for me, that's the biggest change with 2.0. And the thing I would ask all of you, uh, see some of our clients here, is that you could contribute a huge amount by sharing your use cases working on data context within the context of FTC3 2.0. So that would be my big ask, that um, the API is fine, um, may or may not use it. We have examples of where it's kind of handy that software vendors have used it. But the big thing that I think that all of you could contribute is more use cases and richer data context. And we'll show that a little bit as we're going through the demo. So I think probably that's what I wanted to say here. Um, and some of this stuff... Uh, is a quick refresher on FTC3. I won't go into very much detail, but uh, it's, a, it's a messaging standard. It's about APIs, not message formats, for doing two major tasks. Um, uh, click to sync and click to launch. Um, and um, the bit here, that if I had a pointer, I would highlight, maybe I can reach up, is the FTC3 <coughs> enables true plug-and-play interoperability and discovery on the desktop without prior bilateral agreements. That without prior bilateral agreements is another key tenant of Interop. It talks about the fact that I can write and publish an application as FTC3, FTC3 aware, and then a year later, somebody maybe in a client writes an application. I have no knowledge of that application. It didn't exist even as a spec when I wrote my app. And it runs in the FTC3 environment, and it just works. There's no need for us to negotiate. So in the demo that um, um, Dimitri prepared for Mike and I, when we run the video, um, you'll see these interactions, and it will look great. You know, uh, single track will work really closely with Symphony. But the point is, single track have not written to a Symphony API. They're publishing and using FTC3 APIs, FTC3 data context, and that's the key benefit, I think, there. And they work together because um, that's what FTC3 is for, no, no prior bilateral agreement. Um, and um, 
The final bit is think fix for the desktop. So in Glue 42, we're talking about straight through workflows, we're trying to build on the straight through um, processing for OMSs. And I think FTC3 is fixed, and, and, and both on the good side and the bad side. So it's fixed because um, it's standard and it's built cooperatively between competing companies. It's fixed because it's very easy to use it in incompatible ways, right? I don't know if those of you who work on OMS, it's very easy to have valid fixed messages that don't mean anything to the other side because fixed for a long time just focused on the message flow and didn't say these are the tags you need to describe an order in an exchange-traded equity. I mean, that's grown over the years. And it's also fixed because it's not sufficient to deliver an OMS or an EMS. Fix is a key, really important part, and you need a load of other stuff to deliver a great EMS and OMS. And um, in the same way, FTC3 vital for doing interop, but there are other services that you need from your desktop agent of choice. Um, so, yeah. That's yeah. It. And I think I'll just, you know, why Symphony is here and sort of why, you know, we're excited about this. You know, we're... Our journey with FTC3 and Interop is fairly new. Well, about last year, we, we announced that we were going to be a supporter. We're now a maintainer of the FTC3 standard. And for us, you know, at our core, from, from our product point of view, we believe in openness, flexibility, and connectivity. And that is sort of the same mantra that exists with FTC3 and, and desktop interoperability. We want to enable our customers to create connectivity and workflow within their desktop. And then for us, you know, Symphony, where we're a community of 500,000 financial professionals across buy side, sell side, tier one, tier twos, being able to then create interfirm connectivity and interfirm inter flexibility, where you can now take, I have, I can get to the information I have, I need quickly, and then provide that relevant content to my customer, to my counterparty, seamlessly by connecting FDC3, you know, the desktop interrupt, con you know, containers, and of course, Symphony as the, as the messaging and, and collaboration layer. And we're going to show that to you now. So <clears throat> what we have is a demo where we will play, and Leslie and I will kind of play it together. It'll be a fun sort of two-headed person. Uh, we're going to play a typical sell-side uh, research salesperson um, who's monitoring content, news, you know, trade recaps on, on, their, on their desktop. They see something that is of interest and they want to be able to connect with their customer and provide relevance and context as quickly as possible in using uh, a, a number of tools in Symphony, such as our, our what we call our signals, our new enhanced tags, and then using a Glue 42 um, uh, sort of desktop, creating, creating that connectivity both from Symphony to Glue 42, back to Symphony to single track the, the salesperson CRM, then back to Symphony and to the customer. And then in the end, actually wrapping that all back in the CRM so that you can show, you know, being able to connect all of that, all without, the only thing we'll ever type is an actual message. Everything else will be, you know, single click here, single click there, removing that swiveling and, and context switching for our customers. I'll just add one thing. Yeah, please. Um, it's not particularly well scripted, so I'm, I'm, <coughs> Mike, I'm duly modest about Symphony because when before, FD, before Finos was Finos, it was the Symphony yeah. Software Foundation, and so some of this goes back to those days. So I don't look at it as a new commitment, I look at it as a return to... Fair uh, enough. This whole <laughs> so that's really great. But I think the other bit is just to pick on this idea of workflow, the flow between applications. So most of what the demo you're about to see uses what are called FTC3 intents. So this is the idea about I can invoke a method, a function, an operation in another application, by using FTC3, and that's primarily what you're going to see. Yeah. And the channels, the click to sync, big part of Symphony is not part of this demo, didn't really make sense in what the flow. But the, the point I wanted to make was that the primarily FTC3 talks about flow between applications running on a single desktop agent like Loom42 or any of the others, um, like for example. Uh, and um, that's what it is it's about flow between applications running in a container. <coughs> now, um, Chris and the team from Cosec have been leading an initiative which they're talking about later today to allow bridging between platforms so that within the desktop you can have, uh, say, Glue42 and you're running for Ensemble, those applications will work together. So that extends the scope of the flow between one desktop agent running on the desk one de and, and another desktop agent. But what Symphony does, and I think this is something to really worth bringing out, is it extends the flow between participants. So a flow might originate from user one in a completely different firm, 
and arrive at user two through the secure Symphony channel. And then, because Symphony is committing to FDC three, it can do the whole kind of interop and loading applications that work together. Yeah. And so that kind of expansion of the flow from a single desktop agent yeah. to multiple desktop agents, which uh, Kozak will be talking about later, and then talking about extending it between users using Symphony as a you know secure and trusted channel, and then also they've got their um, workflow development kit, which is like a BPMN type thing from rooms that can also generate those kind of flows from a server to a front end. So I think that's a real theme of 2.0. Not so much new APIs, there are a few changes, better data context, and then expanding flow between desktop agents on the same user and between users using yeah. something like Symfony. Exactly, and, and you know, one of the things that we're seeing really powerful, as, and we'll get into the demo in a moment, <clears throat> is that you know, with Symfony, we connect Symfony to Symfony, so customers, but we now have connectors to WhatsApp, WeChat, SMS for our customers who need those, those um, compliant ways of communicating with their customers on those channels. You can have a, a user have these, you know, these interoperability-powered workflows and then you know, connect to their customer on their customer's preferred channel. So really opening up you know, in that theme of, of connectivity and flexibility. So let's get through it. That worked so far, excellent. So press play, there we go. So what you're looking at is a highly simplified version of a, you know, a sell-side salesperson's desktop. We have Symphony on the left. Uh, and then we have single track on the right. And before I get into Symphony, do you maybe talk a little bit about single track and, and what single track is all about? Single track is a CRM uh, for the financial markets, a lot for wealth management. And it uses uh, Salesforce in part, but it's focused on uh, the CRM for uh, sales traders and people like that. Uh, and so it's uh, um, a major product and runs its own space, and they've committed to FDC3 to enable the kind of interrupt we're seeing. Yeah. We ran a similar demo uh, a few weeks ago uh, with Paul Dyson was here and was able to give a much better description of what, <laughs> what single track does. Do, does but yeah. It's a CRM for Exactly. Sales. And here on the Symphony side, what you're looking at is, you know, across the top, this user has a number of workflows. So you see their client's workflow, their external, their ex internal. And then what we're actually looking at is what we call our signals view on Symphony. So they've got a filter view of all of their incoming Symphony content based on the tag that they think is most important to, to them or us or me. And in this case, it's, you know, looking at the market color tags. You see the, the hashtags of market color. So this is a sort of a general filter that um, the salesperson has for any kind of incoming content that might be coming into their, into their Symphony view. And you can see we have sort of user content and then we have bot content as well. So in this case, what we have is a, is a trade recap that was posted uh, automatically by an application that could have been using our WDK, uh, which is our, our sort of our, our low code, no code ability to create bots and workflows visually. And you'll see here, in this case, um, it's a trade recap, and um, the user has seen it, and it's uh, about uh, Alder Tree Asset Management, which is an important customer, and you see this market color button here. And that market color button is an FDC3 enabled workflow. So I can now click on that market color button to understand more color around Tesla, the underlying security, and immediately open up uh, my Glue 42 desktop to be able to see that. And we'll see if we can sync up the video with the click in a second or so, or otherwise I'll pause. Um, but being able, there you go, I clicked on it. And now immediately, I'm seeing you know, order history, a chart, market depth. I don't know, Liz, if you want to talk more about kind of, the, you know, this is a, a Glue42 demo version of Just sort of a, the button invoked an FTC3 intent called Start Workflow. The Start Workflow, we have an implementation of that that loads a Glue 42 workspace that lets them do the work they want around the market color. And here you see a load of applications in a workspace all focused on Tesla, which was where the market color came from. And um, that's, you've got, and that's a key piece, right? Obviously what you've got is potentially very trivial. We've run a few applications, focused them, but there's no searching for Windows, starting, copy, paste, anything like that. It's just a natural extension of how the user wants to work. They want to move from their uh, market color message to a workspace that lets them explore what's happening with Tesla. And now they're looking at this, they're looking at the order history, and they're going to see um, that they want that they want to talk to, um, they want to see what messages have I had around Tesla. Tesla exactly. And that's going to be taking them back into yep. Symphony. So now you'll see an intent sent back to Symphony. I'll just pause it just to make sure we kind of 
kind of make sure that that's clear. So now we're going the other way. So from Glue42, uh, there was an FTC theory intent for view messages with the context of Tesla. So the ticker, this is where our enhanced tags come through. And now my view on Symphony has updated where I'm specifically looking at any messages that I've received that refer to the, secure, uh, with, to the, the security Tesla, so TSLA in there, and you see some of them also have market color, but in this case, it's a specific filter for Tesla with a, with a single click. I just add one thing there, yeah. which is I'd like to see it from Glue42, but actually that's not the case. What you've got here is a set yeah. of in-house applications hosted in Glue42, and they've um, decided to make use of an intent and move back from the in-house applications to Symfony. So what we see here is... Uh, Symphony, a major third-party application, single track informed third-party application, load of in-house applications, all work working together, none of which were designed with each other in mind. They're just FTC3 aware. So I think that's the only point I wanted to yeah, bring out. Yeah, very fair. And I think, and now what we're seeing is, in this case, we're using our new Symphony enhanced tags. So Symphony's had sort of cache tags and hashtags since, since its inception. And, you know, those are, um, you know, Dumb isn't the right word, but maybe it is. They're they're just they're just you know text with a with a with an object in front of it to signify this should have structure. <clears throat> with our new enhanced tags, and you see it on this view, we now have securities that have that understand the underlying identifier. So ISIN, Figgy, etc. So you can now create truly far more rich, far more intuitive and intelligent workflows because you'll actually you'll be able to actually share an identifier across applications. So in this case, I see that Tesla is referring to this ISIN, um, and I have a variety of actions. And this, this list of actions can be customized per user. So if I have various Symfony applications or other workflows that I connect to, I can, I can look at you know, my internal research. I can, do, I can create various workflows off of that security view, all powered potentially by FDC3. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to go view that instrument, and again, to Leslie's point, pass back an intent. In this case, you'll see an intent where there are multiple applications on that user's desk that they can then choose from based on the workflow that they want to create. So in some case, I might want to look at a piece of research or I might want to open up my CRM. So if you want to, you want to talk about the intent resolver, in this case, Leslie? I mean, so view instrument is a, um, a predefined uh, FTC3 intent. Any applications are free to offer it. And... Um, what happens when, when you're running, you see which applications are available, started or defined, that can offer view intent. And if there's more than one, then you, you provide the user with a check, a, a, a check yeah. uh, a selection box. And here they selected to see the instrument in the context of, the, of single track, um, to see which of my clients are interested in that instrument. But the important points, I think, are that um, if I want to go to a particular application. I don't have to show a selector. The application could say call view intents in single track. Sure. But here it's just whatever is running at the moment that can do view instrument, let the user choose it. And that's what we're doing here. And so yep. the user selected, well, Dimitar, back in his sick bed, <laughs> selected uh, to see, uh, see it in single track. And here he's seeing the um, yep. uh, instrument in yeah, everything to do with the template. Yeah, in this case, we're using single track to look at um, recent research readership of by customers on Tesla. They pulled up Megan, who is the same customer uh, at Alder Tree. So he can now also see, you know, again, these single clicks to say, a trade was done. I can see what research of mine that customer has read recently. And now I'm actually going to go and share an updated set of researches. You know, that trade is now a reason, a reason for a conversation where we're seeing a, a single track workflow where uh, Demeter has selected a piece of research and is uh, going to send it back to the end user. Again, being able to provide all this context throughout their workflow. And I'm going to pause it here. There we go. To kind of talk about sort of the next, again, we have this selector component again. But Ma Michael spoke about um, a single track workflow for sharing research with clients. And what it really is, is that's how, in the old, old ways, you might have looked at it. But obviously, the actual share research with clients involves finding the research, finding the client. That all happens within single track, and then choosing to distribute it with them, which is when single track we might go, oh, however you want to do that. And now we're using Symphony's um, FTC3 capabilities to move directly from single track out to uh, Symphony to complete that workflow, which is really a user workflow 
which starts in symphony and uh, starts to sing a track and ends in symphony. Exactly. Yeah, and and what we had, we've kind of this is we we purposely chosen this the selector here to highlight something new um, in terms of Symphony's FDC three journey. So what we've been using here on the left hand side is what we call the Symphony SDA, which is our electron powered uh, desktop application. We also now have what's called the Symphony ECP, which is our embedded collaboration platform. And what ECP is is it's a modularized, embeddable version of, Sym of a, the Symphony application that can be put in a web app in a variety of configurations, styles, and use cases. And it can be complemented with human as well as bot and other workflows that are powered, you know, generally by Symphony. And what that allows a user, our customers to do is, if they have a web application, imagine it's their operations platform or it's a, um, you know, it's a, a research platform or one of our third-party partners, that Symphony can now be embedded in that application, minimizing that context flow, context switching. It also is now FDC3 enabled, so it can also be embedded in a desktop interop provider's container. So in this case, we're going to show it in the Glue42 container, but it could also have been embedded in another one of the desktop interop providers to, again, create that, that seamless connectivity and unlock more workflows in and around messaging workflows for our customers, minimizing the need to switch contexts. And when I open this up, so you'll see a situation where a user has two versions of Symphony on their desk. This isn't admittedly realistic. It'll more likely they'd have one or the other, but just to sort of illustrate that we have that flexibility now that we didn't have before to provide sort of that contextual workflow of messaging and uh, connecting to the end user. I paused it for too long now, so we're going to have to... Here's the tap dancing. Here we go. If you switched on the video, you'd hear David saying something very similar. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, um, you know, and this is something that's, that, you know, just the, the ECP sort of... You know, this is something that is, again, very new for Symphony in the way that we think about how Symphony <coughs> exists within our user's workflow ecosystem and the connectivity that it provides. So you can now put Symphony in the context. Throughout this, you see messaging in the context of a CRM, messaging in the context of data, data visualization, and all of this about workflow. So here we go. Demeter's opened up um, Symphony. You now see it's the, you know, it sent an intent with send message. We, you know, we put in a, a piece of text. Demeter's going to add some more customization to that to show value to their, his customer. And then he's going to, again, add an enhanced tag. So you can also, you saw sort of the visualization of the enhanced tag once it's already been entered, but you can also manually enter those texts. So it enables both you know, application to application workflows around structured objects, but also end users. So he's going to add a market color, hashtag, and then he'll add, again, hashtag Tesla. But you see in that autocomplete, he's actually selecting Tesla US, the US dollar version of the equity ticker. And today, the first version of our enhanced tags does support equities, and we'll be expanding to more asset classes uh, throughout 2020. Three, that's next year, I got there. Um, so yeah, so he's gonna press send here, and you'll see that open up into a symphony message. This is where he's again pausing, talking about how great enhanced tags are. Thank you, Demeter. <laughs> um, anything before, so we're going into the last sort of phase of this. So he sent it in, and that's entered it into a message, so he's now in the conversation with Megan, his customer. You have the piece of research from single track, the hashtag, as well as the enhanced tag. And in this case, uh, we also have an intent to share the actual message body with another application, any application that is FDC3 enabled. So in this case, he sees that prior message from Megan. He says, oh, that's an important interaction that I want to capture in my CRM with a single click. So no more entering a call note, no more rekeying. I can simply type up, you know, click on the, the message overflow button there and click on, I believe it says share message. The thing I'd make out yeah. is single track use... Um Salesforce, so what you'll see actually is a Salesforce Lightning component come up within the context of single track, which also has a Glue 42, and uh, is also Glue 42 enabled, and so um, they're using both the single track connection and our uh, uh, Salesforce connector to take the whole message, the whole context, and log it into the CRM. Yeah. You saw with that, that, that would share that message, and it opens, can open up single track where you see now the interaction captured in single track with just a single, you know, two clicks, overflow and share message. And that can be shared with other applications. This is a CRM use case, but if that body of that message is, and the context of that message is useful in other applications, again, the power of FDC3 is any FDC3 enabled application can, can capture that. And that is the demo. So hopefully what, what we've shown is um, 
a real-world use case, a load of uh, single tracks and in-house applications, which are obviously Mock, and uh, single track and Symphony working together using FTC3, showing how the FTC3 intents allow applications to work together without being pre-written. So actually, should someone be foolish enough to have a different chat system, single track will continue to work. And if uh, a Symphony user is using some other uh, CRM, that would also just work. And that is the power of FTC3, and that's really about why, as a, as a cross-industry consortium, um, and, uh, it's so powerful, and why these data contexts to be agreed between parties are so, so useful. Um, I won't really go through too much about what's going on in FTC3 2.0. Um, I did, covered that at the beginning, but I will mention just one piece that we added, which was uh, there's been an application directory, kind of an app store from the very first 1.0, and that used to say that the definition of the application depending on which container. So the application directory might hold an open fin or a fin symbol or a glue 42 definition. So one thing we did was to create a cross-container uh, um, application definition which would, uh, can be used by any um, supporting container, which I think is important as the number of desktop agents containers um, grows. Um, and that idea about, as a software vendor, the extent to which FDC3 allows you to write your code, you don't care which platform, which desktop agent is there. That's an important part that we've started doing, not sure how far we'll go, uh, because Actually, if you want to deliver the kind of integrated experience that we're talking about here, workflows, workspaces, there's a load of other features you really need to provide that kind of coherence, which outside the scope of FTC3, uh, workflows, layouts, notifications, which may come in in 2.1, window management, search, streaming, uh, scripting, the ability to kind of control something, another application. Those are all things which you may want as a software vendor which are platform-specific um, functions outside of FTC3. So hopefully that's a little bit of what's in 2.0, a little bit of why FTC3 helps solve some real problems and some uh, real code running uh, to, show, to show what it does. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions, whether there are any questions and whether there's anybody who can even uh, bring them through. So there's no Slido. So if you want to, we do it old school. If anybody's got any questions, please shout out or stick your hand up. If you're sorry? Do you have a backend pricing team? Yeah. Do you want to expand the prices from the back? Um, so, I mean, I, I, I have got a very, 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 very strong background in market data distribution systems, right? So, going back to the original PTW, I won't go there. Uh, if you're going to FISD tonight, I'll go there. Um, and so, it's not necessarily an FTC3 issue. There are FTC3 integration, interop is not designed for high performance streaming. Glue 42 has a streaming function. You can use, so there's a, there's what's called a desktop channel, a named context or a colored context. You could choose to write something in the background on the desktop that pushed values there that everybody watching like marketdata.ibm might see updates. My question is actually more. So, Great question. That's outside the... <coughs> the idea is that there'll be some engine on the desktop that would read it and publish it. And so in the demo you just saw, Symphony was that engine. So some of those market colors were coming from a server and it was being published by Symphony and Symphony was on the desktop participating in that FTC3 environment. Yeah. So whatever mechanism you're using to push out your updates, you'd have a client on the uh, desktop reading it and pushing it out. So, for example, we have a Bloomberg Market Data Adapter piece, and that sits there, reads the Bloomberg API on the desktop or from the server API, and publishes it out there. Yeah? What was the magic of going cross-process to three and one? And yep. Assuming the two are so that's the magic of FDC3. That's, you know, from that click sent an intent to the, the other application on the desktop. Yeah. Oh, no, so it's the FTC3 API yeah. is an API 
you bring in an implementation, so you bring in a Glue 42 or Ensemble implementation, and it makes use of the whatever's going on. So most of us are using a uh, WebSocket-based component that is sending stuff through there. But, you do, but with, when you write to the FTC3 API, you don't actually see the underlying messages and stuff. It's just a, a JavaScript function call. Thank you. Yeah. When you talk about message, is it really like you're sending a message through some sort of message you passed or something? So it, it, you call an API function and you pass a chunk of JSON, which is the data context. So, for example, the start workflow was uh, a JavaScript call that says um, call intent, name is start workflow, and here's the context. And then that gets packaged up and distributed depending on which agent you're using. So, but the so this is a process running on the desktop. Yeah, so FTC3 is, is an API and not an implementation. And so what you get is what are called desktop agents, be it Glue 42, be it OpenFin, be it Finsomble, that implement those things. Um, you don't care which one you're running on. You should have no knowledge, but it, yeah, there's something underneath that pushes the messages around. So, so one of the implementations could be a messaging bus? All of the implementations have got some kind of messaging in them. And the th there's a talk later on uh, this afternoon from someone from Cosaic showing how you can move those messages between one desktop agent and another desktop agent. So, um, so you can ask. Yeah. I think we're about to, I think the next group is coming in, so.